Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Retro Monster Truck Review Podcast. My name is Josh Rhodes, and today we've got Colby Marshall on the show. He's going to join us on our journey across time in monster truck racing. Colby runs the MTRC group on YouTube, if you want to go check it out. It's super realistic RC monster truck racing, as well as does MT Unlimited for the Monster Blog, and he also does some cleanup work for old school monster truck footage for the International Museum and Monster Truck Hall of Fame. This is a really good episode. I really hope you guys are going to enjoy Houston, 1980. Without further ado, though, it's time for the Retro Monster Truck Review. again everybody welcome to yet another retro monster truck review podcast my name is josh rhodes today we've got colby marshall on the show the president of the mtrc racing club and done a lot of stuff for the monster blog as well this man knows his history i've leaned on him quite a bit for this podcast uh just for as many episodes as we've had really colby uh today though we're covering one of your favorite events here uh houston astrodome ninth excuse me houston astrodome november 7th 1987 uh, probably one of the premier Astrodome events, really, from back in the day. And it really was. Um, th- yeah, like you said, this was my favorite event as a kid. Um, just loved the track, uh, loved the venue. It was so big and, you know, just a cavern of a building that they could really do a lot with. And I kind of feel while USHRA might have been in a little bit of a, you know, minimalist effort, you know, when it came to tracks, this was one they didn't do that with, and it was really appreciated, and it showed. Exactly. I agree. Uh, one thing here that you actually noted in an article we posted earlier this week was this was the first event that really anybody can remember that coined the term World Finals. There were only six trucks at this event, but they coined that term World Finals mainly probably because this was the biggest venue that they were competing in at the time. The Astrodome is honestly what I would call – it's like the – How do I compare it? NASCAR and Daytona, Astrodome and Monster Trucks at the time, probably the biggest event that they're going to compete in. Yeah, and and I think as much, um, you know, as much just that it was the biggest venue, it was actually pretty much the last like big show that they put on for that season. Mm -hmm. So so they and and I think even I want to say it's Jim Cramer actually references that a little bit. This is the final show of the season, so you know they're calling it the World Finals. Um, yeah, and I really feel like between the Astrodome and Pontiac, those are kind of your two big meccas of monster trucks. Those are your places where you had the biggest events, some of the best history, and and really just places that were, you know, must-see. Anytime you see that pop up, say on YouTube or an old video, see one of those two places pop up, they're going to be, you know you're going to get a top-notch event. I agree 100% on that stuff. I mean, heck, when you – some of the old camera views that you would see inside the Astrodome as well, it just – it makes the place look larger than it actually is, if that makes sense. Because you can see all of these people just in – almost like they're surrounding the action that's going on inside the Astrodome. It's it's some amazing stuff. And I actually really do love seeing some of the old serial uh, footage of this place when it's empty. Yeah, because, I mean, it literally is just, it's so big. And any place that was able to house both football and baseball, because baseball's got got the requirement for such a huge field. Uh-huh. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to shoot a couple times in Montreal. And while the the actual venue size is a bit smaller and doesn't hold quite as many people, you, the, the floor is just so gigantic that, that it's really just hard to describe how big these places are. And, and having been to Pontiac and it was a football stadium, and they, you know, it's a big building and it holds a lot of people, but floor size, there's nothing to compare to these these dual use stadiums that that were kind of, I guess, in style at the time through the 60s, 70s, 80s and into the, you know, into the mid 90s mm-hmm. that they, they were able to to fit so many different types of events in them. But that to, to do so, they just had to be gigantic and. And this was definitely one, and it stood out, like you said, especially in those empty shots of it, where it's just you you can't comprehend how big the floor is on these places. Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing to note here, actually, this place did house the MLB, the NFL, and for a short time, the NBA played here with uh, the Houston Astros, the Houston Oilers, and, of course, um, 
I'm blanking on the name. Of course, I'm talking about the Houston Rockets. I don't know why I blanked on the name right there. The Rockets uh, literally have it in my notes in front of me looking at it and completely blanked on it. Uh, They played the Rockets played there from 71 to 75. Astros from 65 to 1999 and the Oilers from 68 to 96. I mean, this place was in commission for a long time with these teams. There were a lot of historical events here uh, just over time. Of course, this housed the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo from 1966 to 2002. But this was also uh, the first major sporting event to install artificial turf that would later be coined, surprise, surprise, the AstroTurf. Correct. And, and, and you know, the breadth of just events that they could put in here, like we were just saying, like you were just saying, and, and I kind of touched on before, really lended itself to what we do with monster trucks. And that I really feel like that's, you know, that made it a focus, not only for obviously USHRA, but for TNT as well. And, and even before TNT, you know, kind of quote unquote debuted on television with this event, the, the actually the same year in 1987, TNT was putting on just gigantic events where, you know, you would literally have sections of the floor dedicated to three, four different competitions where they would have, a, you know, two pulling tracks on opposite sides of the floor. They'd have a mud pit. They'd have the monster truck area and they would just alternate between events. So it was nonstop. So a tractor would pull and then a monster truck would run and then a mud, you know, a mud truck would run and then the next class of pulling could be on the opposite end of the, you know, of the stadium doing the same thing. And it was just, it it made for some very interesting events, especially from TNT, but, uh, but hot rod really seemed to take this venue over the years, especially the early years of like 87, 88, 89, uh, you know, that are available for, uh, for viewing on television. It seemed to take them and, and really put them to their next level with USHRA where they were willing to put together a bigger track and, you know, just more of a spectacle. And they were, they were very much more about the spectacle than the, the, you know, than the competition end of it, like TNT was. And I always gravitated more towards the spectacle. And so I really enjoyed these events as, 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 you know, when this event came out, I was six years old. So Oh, yeah, I, I enjoy these old USHR events, USHRA events as well, mainly for that, the spectacle that we got to see. The very first episode of this podcast was the uh, Houston, or excuse me, the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana, and it was the return of the monster trucks. And that event, in, it, in and of itself, as much as we griped about the racetrack on that particular episode, it was still a spectacle to see. And I'm sure that people remembered everything about that when they went home that night. They didn't think about oh production issues or how long it took or anything like that. They re- what they remembered from that is did you see Bigfoot hit those cars? Did you see that awesome Kong truck pull the wheel stand over the hill? The spectacle is what the USHRA was selling you instead of not necessarily the actual competition that you were going to see. And it's amazing that as as much as as the sport itself has changed that aspect of their that company's competition through however many you know sales to different companies to different you know entities over the years that was and still remains to this day their mo they are mm-hmm. spectacle first and you know look up in the stands even at this event and you see some of these camera angles of just how packed the stands were and the same thing applies to today the the spectacle sells for them and they sell it better than pretty much anybody has in the history of this sport yep i agree uh let's get into some more history here of the astrodome october 15th 1986 the astros and the visiting new york mets played game six of the 1986 nlcs here 16 inning contest and at the time the longest in mlb open or excuse me mlb season history uh we also had the game of the century played here between the houston cougars and the us ucla bruins took place on January 20th, 1968, before a crowd of, get this, 52,963. A record for the largest attendance ever for a basketball game until the year 2003. That's a lot of years in between 68 and 2003 right there. One of the funnier things I found in here, this was the host of the Battle of the Sexes tennis match on September 20th, 1973. Billie Jean King defeating Bobby Riggs in three straight sets. Uh, then we scroll down a little bit here. We see uh, Muhammad Ali fought here in November of 1966 against Cleveland Williams in the Astrodome. 
And one that's near and dear to both of our hearts, I think. April 1st, 2001, WrestleMania 17, probably the greatest WrestleMania of all time, highlighted by Stone Cold Steve Austin taking on The Rock, their second WrestleMania main event here. 67,925 fans still to this day at Astrodome record. It's unbelievable just like the the amount of people to for especially for an event like WrestleMania or you know the Battle of the Sexes tennis or even for basketball how small relatively those floors or those competition areas are or performance areas however you want to put it and still to put 50 60,000 people in there, you realize how far away some of those people really were oh, yeah. from the action. They couldn't have seen too much, but just the draw, you know, the building is as much of a draw as the event sometimes, where it's like you you want to be in a crowd that big, and hopefully we can get back to that relatively soon in this world, because I sure miss being around those big crowds. Oh, God, me too. Uh, a couple of interesting things here I found that were held in the Astrodome, aside from some concerts featuring the Jacksons, with Michael Jackson, Elvis, Madonna, Pink Floyd, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Selena, etc. Uh, the USAC actually held a couple of races here. I did not know this when I was until I was doing some uh, research for this. And in one of the events, a very famous name won, and that was A.J. Foyt. So A.J. Foyt and Jim Cramer share a stat. They both won in the Astrodome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's interesting there, you know, and, and it's another comparison to Pontiac is they actually did some, and I don't know that it was USAC, but I know that they did some dirt circle track racing there. Mm-hmm. And um, so that that's another piece of history that those two share. And we really didn't see that up until just a few years ago when actually here in St. Louis, um, where they did circle track racing in the, you know, in what is now the dome at the America center. I almost called it the Edward Jones dome because that's mm-hmm. what it was for so many years, but that, you know, how, how ahead of the times they really were with those type of events. Like who would have thought to put a, you know, a circle track in a dome football stadium, but it sure works. And I, you know, having seen them in person, it, it does work and it's amazing. And, I can only imagine what a USAC event with a name like AJ Foyt would have been like in a oh, yeah, place especially in that at that time whenever it was like peak of his popularity pretty much inside the Astrodome. Uh, let's get to the actual event though here. Uh, the truck lineup, Rich Hoosier and Bigfoot number four. We've got Kevin Dabney and Duraliner Giant, Mike Nickel and Excalibur, Deal Wilson, Virginia Giant, Fred Schaefer, Barefoot number three, Don Maples and Samson One, and uh, Bill Townsend and Virginia Beach Beast is here and our broadcasters for this mike galloway and surprise jim kramer you know exactly why jim is in the booth here you care to share that with us sure and 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 i guess just to before we go on to that just to add a couple of things it's interesting you said kevin dabney um i that's actually the first i've actually heard who actually drove at this event because they never say it they never mention the driver's name they never put up a lower third graphic so we had no idea who was driving Duraliner liner mm-hmm. giant for this one um yeah, and, and as far as Jim Cramer goes, uh, they were both of them were uh, him and Mike Galloway were joined uh, uh, briefly by uh, John Paul Della Camera, and he's mm-hmm. uh, gone on to be a pretty uh, pretty famous soccer announcer actually. So you had a really good booth for this one, but Cramer uh, instead of being in the seat, uh, turns out that uh, he hurt his shoulder the exactly one week before in Oakland. Um, it, and that was another televised event where it was really just this amazing battle between him and uh, fellow Monster Truck Hall of Famer Jim Reese and AMPM boss. And those two were uh, putting those trucks through their paces and uh, Kramer's shoulder, who which would go on to bother him later in life. And I don't think it's any secret why when you're hanging out the window of a, you know, 13,000 pound monster truck flying 15 feet in the air, it's gonna gonna happen. So Mm -hmm. that was kind of the beginning of those problems for him. So it took him out for this event, but it gave us a really, really good voice in that booth and a voice that, uh, that would really kind of help make this event, I think, you know, it more even even better than it probably was. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Jim Cramer knows his stuff, and when you put a guy that's as smart as Jim Cramer is in the booth as a color analyst for this event, I mean, he he knows exactly what he's talking about, and it really helps. And as I put in my notes here, he's a much better person to have in the booth than Don Breitweiser, <laughs> who we covered for Louisville 87 just a little bit earlier in uh, this podcast here. Uh, Astrodome has always been a spe- special place as far as the monster trucks go. There's a reason that this building has not been torn down. The legends of monster truck racing have referred to it as it, the Mecca, basically meaning that if you race here, 
you've made it in the sport. And that's a direct quote from Dennis Anderson. Uh, just being in the field was a privilege back in the day of these guys. But however, not a lot of people could call themselves a winner inside the Astrodome. As far as substitutes for Bigfoot go, Rich Hoosier's just about, if there was a, at the time, Kramer number one, I would honestly say that Hoosier's probably 1A at this point. Yeah, and I think uh, this was my, as, as a kid, this was my introduction to Rich Hooser. And um, he, you know, he was just a few months away from really just being the the guy as far as television goes for Bigfoot. And, mm. you know, I, I remember as a kid being kind of like, oh, my gosh, where's Jim Cramer? How, are, how is Bigfoot going to win this, being the big Bigfoot fan that I was? But now looking back on it, you're, you're correct. There, there was nobody else... Well, easily nobody else on that team, but it's, but very few in the industry that would have been would have been able to take that those reins, that mantle up, and really be able to run with it. And and Rich, Rich Hooser was definitely the guy. Oh yeah, he definitely was. Uh, Kramer gives us a track explanation here that I found to be very well spoken and very professional. He speaks uh, he speaks over the race between Excalibur and Virginia Giant being highlighted here. Uh, this is the first event, as we said earlier, to be referred to as the World Finals as a selling point. Six trucks competing, a very tight racetrack, and unique for the Astrodome at the time. Uh, you're starting on a roll, or starting behind a roller hill. You go over the roller hill, and then you go into a pyramid of cars, which is at this time incredible to look at. That you're thinking that, oh my God, these trucks are basically going over the, a double stack of cars. Uh, then another tight turn, or excuse me, another. Hill before a tight turn reminds me of a certain racing series we both competed in, but anyway, <laughs> we go around we go around that tight turn and then a long straightaway to a set of about six junk cars and then a finish line. Uh, this was also one thing I wanted to point out probably before the time of self centering rear steering. So that long straightaway was basically there to get your tire rear tires as straight as you could before you actually hit those cars back there. And the guys at Bigfoot were very well trained at getting those tires as straight as they could possibly get. And I think that's part of the reason that foot four is going to succeed very well here. Yeah. And, and it, it, as you kind of look at it very closely, it does make a difference in a couple of the races. Um, the, the self-centering rear steer not being there and, and the ability to gather that up. Um, I, I will say that it almost kind of felt like, like, Rich Hooser kind of figured that out as the event went on. And, uh, you know, and especially in, in the second round that we'll get to, it, it's noticeable that it's not quite as smooth as it may have been. Um, what I kind of find interesting, though, is you, you, know, you mentioned Kramer's kind of introduction to the track, how, how much foreshadowing he was able to do. <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this interview with, you know, with Mike Galloway standing by Bigfoot 4, He's, he's able to point at the two parts of the track that, you know, everybody pays attention to the pyramid. And the pyramid was, you know, that was probably most people's introduction to it. And I know it had been used a few times outdoors as like an exhibition crush type obstacle. And I know that, uh, you know, soon after this time, Seth Dalton and, and his shows for Golden State used it all, all, in almost every show. It was, a, it was a feature. But again, it was an exhibition obstacle. It wasn't a racing obstacle. Uh, but Kramer, you know, he, he touches on it, but he also touches the, the thing that he focuses on is the turn being the toughest part of the track. And, the, and that and his... <laughs> His statement of that last set of cars will make you or break you here is a Godzilla-sized pile of foreshadowing. Oh, I yep. You I, know, and and it's amazing how just in looking at that track, he he being, in my opinion, the the greatest of all time, you know, is able to just look at that track and go, "That's where it's going to be won or lost." And yep. he was absolutely right. Yep, it puts you in the mind. It would be. Uh... To, to make a comparison to those that may not know exactly uh, what Colby was referring to here, uh, if Jim Cramer says something, most people are going to listen to it. And I would say nine out of ten people at this time would probably listen to it. It'd be like if Dale Earnhardt said, hey, you know what, turn four is going to be real treacherous this weekend. About 38 of the 43 drivers in that field are going to take it a little bit easier in turn four at uh, whatever racetrack they might be at. That's a comparison uh, between sports to what people would have thought, thought of Jim Cramer at the time. The man 
exactly as you're saying at this time, probably the stage one and early stage two monster truck goat, as far as I'm concerned, the man hardly ever lost a race. And when he did, he was very gracious in defeat as well. Kramer, uh, a guy you can't say enough good things about. Correct. I mean, just one of the most straightforward, but a lot of people will use straightforward as kind of a crutch to just be a jerk. <laughs> and there is not any of that in Jim Cramer. He, he will tell you exactly how he feels and as level headed. And he is right way more often than he's not. Very true. Round one racing here. We get Bigfoot four and Duraline or giant Bigfoot being piloted by Rich Hauser. I mean, wait, <laughs> Rich, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a couple of event, events ago, we were talking about the great production quality that we had at, say, Louisville in 1990 with uh, TNT Motorsports Free SPN. Here, not so much. There are many misspellings of drivers' names here. In this one, we get Rich Hauser. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe they misspelled that one. It seems like it's pretty straightforward to me to say Hoosier. Yeah, they, they didn't even, uh, there's a general rule working in the television industry like I do. There is a general rule that you make sure you know how people's names are spelled and it's actually a legal situation. So that tells me that probably in that three year span between 1987 and 1990, you know, going backwards in that span, they were probably just sending out whoever they could find to cover these little events and they just did not know and did not care. Yep, unfortunate. Uh, according to, or excuse me, if there's one thing I can't stand, uh, it's uh, misspelling of someone's name. And that happened a lot back in the day, unfortunately. I think of uh, poor Jerry Porter over there in a <laughs> Carolina Crusher. But anyway, uh, we yeah, see was... a close-up of Giant here uh, going over the hill. And then the camera cuts back and we see a massive advantage for Bigfoot. They didn't cover, they didn't even show the start here for Bigfoot. But when they pull back, there's a massive, like, two-truck link lead here between Bigfoot 4 and Duraliner Giant. Uh, as you put in your notes, Giant probably not really made for this style of event at this time. Um, Bigfoot extends the lead over the pyramid and just further extends the lead around the corner and just goes on to blow away Virginia Giant here in this round one matchup. But I will say, Virginia, or excuse me, Duraliner Giant comes back and gives you quite the little show over the cars before it pulls off and you don't see it the rest of the night. A beautiful sky wheelie by Dabney. It really was. And, you know, it, it's interesting to look at Duraliner Giant through this race. And, you know, how many times on television, especially the, the first three or four times you probably saw that truck on TV, it just had all sorts of problems with the drive shaft falling out. And, you know, um, actually, it's interesting. If you really watch this closely, you'll notice that uh, Duraliner has a, a it's missing part of the Duraliner logo on the left front quarter panel. And it was actually two weeks before this race that um, in, in Pontiac that they had their, that the Dabney team had their kind of infamous, for lack of a better term, race with Heartbeat, where Heartbeat, the whole rear axle fell out of the truck, mm -hmm. and Duraliner broke the left front wheel off on the last hit. And if you, if you look close, you can see that it does some damage to that quarter panel. Well, they've gotten the quarter panel replaced, but they haven't gotten the, the lettering back on. But that truck was definitely a you know, more built towards what Hot Rod did, which was more of the exhibition car crush type things. It yep. was, wasn't always that way. And, um, you know, a, a few, actually a few years later when, you know, it was just running as giant, it was actually one of the more consistent um, and durable performers in the early Thunder Nationals stuff, which is hard to believe that that giant truck that weighed so much with that huge motor sticking way up out of the hood like that, would ever turn into a decent racer, but it was. Mm -hmm. It just took a few years for them to get there. Yeah, a few years of development can turn into a really good racer. I mean, look at Awesome Kong, for example. Yep. That truck uh, truck started out as a, a show truck, basically, and ends up going into TNT and becoming Skinny Kong and running through the field sometimes at some of those events. It was a top 10 truck, easily in TNT Motorsports. Uh, Duraliner Giant, as well as you're, uh, you're saying here in the Thunder National Series, I've seen some old footage of that, and it's hard to believe that that's the same truck that's out here at this event right here. Uh, also, I do want to point out at the time, whenever it was in Thunder National, I believe it was on 66s, here they're running 73s, which is probably the tallest truck in the field at this time. Maybe um, maybe uh, between it and Samson as far as the tallest truck in this field. Correct. And, you know, it just, it just wasn't, a, it wasn't a race truck at the time. 
Um, and that, and, and that was fine. It was, it was a beautiful truck. Uh, one thing going, going back to Bigfoot on this race is, you know, when that camera cut happens and they finally go out wide, Bigfoot is way ahead in this race. But I, I noticed kind of when it comes off the period pyramid, it kind of seems to bind up the truck somehow. Like it just doesn't like that pyramid. And, and when it lands, you know, it, it's still in the lead, but there's something about the way it lands that, that tells me that it might struggle a little bit with that pyramid. And it seems to the rest of the night. And, and I think that makes a, you know, it kind of becomes crucial later on in mm -hmm. other rounds to make some other rounds really, uh, really tight and some really good racing. Yep. Speaking of really good racing here, we get Excalibur and Virginia Giant. We saw a little bit of this earlier when uh, Jim Kramer was speaking. They highlighted this this particular race in the background. Uh, Kramer with some expert commentary here about the Excalibur truck, stating that it's a little bit slower in the turns, but it is excellent on the cars, and he is not wrong there. That truck soaked up landings back in the day when you watch the old Excalibur truck hit those cars. It was one of the early trucks that I remember watching that, did it have a bounce to it after it landed? Yes. Was it a minimal bounce compared to everybody else? Very much so, as far as the Excalibur truck goes. Virginia Giant, on the other hand, taking a different approach here suspension-wise. This truck's almost slammed straight down onto the tires. It reminded me of one of the first, not necessarily, I don't want to say low rider, but it's it's down very much so compared to Excalibur, who sits very high here. It's a top-heavy truck versus a truck that's kind of low to the ground. Almost, actually, you know what? I'll put it this way. Uh, if you ever seen RC monster trucks, there are some guys out there that have that philosophy that they've got to have a really high-bodied truck, and there's some guys that have a body that's slammed down against the tires. And a lot of the times, you see that truck that's slammed down is the truck that's going to win the race. And right here, that's what happens. Virginia Giant comes out of the hole here. Uh, by about a half a truck, but in the pyramid, and this is where this is what really kind of caught my eye, Colby. It tells you exactly how the suspension worked on Excalibur. That half truck that Virginia Giant had turns into a full truck length behind as soon as Excalibur goes over that pyramid. Correct, and, and Excalibur, you know, contrary to some things that have been put out, Excalibur was actually the first truck that was that used CAD design mm -hmm. um, a, as a central point in its construction, and so. They they had it figured out where they may now by this time I, I can't speak to their motor program but they definitely had the uh, sus, they knew suspension was the key and where other trucks you know like you like you mentioned with Virginia Giant and some of these other trucks at best might have three four five six inches of suspension travel Excalibur was pushing you know a foot if not more now it was still leaf sprung. Mm -hmm. But they they had the they had it figured out earlier than anyone else that that suspension was what it was going to take, and while the truck kind of kicked off to one side when it hit that pyramid, it just soaks everything up and it doesn't really cost him any time. In fact, like you said, it it took a, a half truck deficit and turned it into almost a full truck lead, mm -hmm. and that says a whole lot about the the design of that truck and also. Uh, you know, the Excalibur guys, Mike and, and Dave, they were not afraid. And they found an, a, a kid, you know, local to them that wasn't afraid to drive that truck. Uh, some kid named Charlie Pawkin. Yeah, I think yeah. I've heard of him. Yeah. So they they were, they but I think a lot of their lack of fear was they knew that the truck would take it. To, to an extent... Yeah, to an extent. And as as we get as we get on in this this the description of this race, there's more to what appears on television that needs to be said as we finish finish up the description of this race. Yeah, Excalibur comes around the corner here, but almost as soon as it comes out of the corner, you see it necessarily it kind of slows down just a little bit here and gives up what it gained over the pyramid. Uh, Virginia Giant comes back. Giant is smooth jumping and landing on all four tires here over the finish line car or over the cars going to the finish line. And uh, Giant gets the win here by about a truck and a quarter length. Uh, Excalibur tries to come back at the very end and you hear that motor of Excalibur kick in too. As soon as it's on, on coming off of those cars, you know, okay, he, he deal wants to win. He better stab the throttle. And that's exactly what he does here to get the win. Uh, it's, Weird that you would see such a lead get evaporated that quickly, though. But I think you have a little more inside information there, maybe what was going on with Mike Nickel at the time. 
Correct. So I, I've I've gotten to know Mike Nickel through the uh, through my work with the Hall of Fame, and and genuinely one of the nicest people you will ever meet. I I adore Mike Nickel. He's such an awesome human being. But Mike had actually earlier that year broken his back for what was the first of two times driving Excalibur. So that tells you how hard they were going. That they had the best suspension, and he still found a way to broke to break his back in the truck. And he told me that this was actually his very first race back from that injury. And he was super hesitant about it. And I think that going over that pyramid as fast as it did kind of spooked him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was super hesitant about kind of what to do from that point. And I think just that few moments of do I really want to do this that went through his head are, are what you saw play out on the track. And, and, you know, against somebody that is as smooth and consistent. And I always refer to D.L. Wilson as kind of the Gary Porter of USHRA. Mm -hmm. Super consistent, maybe not the most flashy personality, but that truck never broke. That truck always ran the same way every time. And it was always strong to really strong when it ran. It may not have been, you know, Bigfoot. It may not have been Excalibur. But you, he knew he could rely on that truck. And if you're gonna if you're gonna do what Mike did, that's probably the one of the worst people in this lineup to do it to. And, yeah. yeah. And Deal ate him up. Yep. Deal did just that. Uh, according to the graphic that pops up though here, apparently a new truck is in the field. The Virginian Giant moves to round number two. Correct. <laughs> uh, and, and driven by Dill. Dill. Dill Wilson. The, yes. the, the the Dill the Pickle Wilson. Yeah, so. the son of uh, the son of uh, Mrs. Pickles, brother yeah. Tommy. You know, yeah, yeah. Dill, Dill Wilson. Anyway, all jokes aside, uh, Barefoot and Samson won here. Uh, mismatch, in my opinion. This Barefoot truck is clearly, I believe, to be the truck with the most horsepower in the field by about maybe two hundred or so horsepower over Samson one. It's pointed out by Mike Galloway here that these two weigh more than the other trucks in the field. And Kramer chimes in and actually says that they probably weigh anywhere from 15 to 18,000 pounds. Samson one, I'm going to say definitely in that 18,000 pound range. I'm going to say the barefoot trucks probably around 15,000 here. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not hundred percent sure off the top of my head. Uh, certainly the heavier truck here though is Samson one who is also on the 73 inch tires. It's a very tall truck here, more of a showpiece. Uh, actually, I, I say that, but then I remember a clip we actually just watched last weekend of this truck going in reverse, and I'm imagining Don Maples is pretty close to making some maple syrup, if you know what I mean in that clip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Samson 1 was geared extremely low. Yep. It, it could pull a sled as well as any other truck in the industry, and it could wheel stand as well as any other truck in the industry because he did have a whole lot of horsepower. It was just that the gearing was was made, and 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 you could draw a parallel, you know, to Duraliner Giant, which was probably pretty close to about the same weight as oh, yeah. as was. Samson One, where they were both show trucks, they were car crush trucks, and they were both very good at that. But having them in a long, difficult race track like this. Probably was not the best booking decision in the world, but you know that's how that goes, especially in that point. You know that point of time, and yeah, it definitely showed. Um, all that being said, you know Fred kind of struggled in this race a little bit. <laughs> you know he yeah. tried to he tried to hit that first roller so hard and nosed in really bad. And yeah, you were talking was... about Bigfoot Four suspension binding up. Fred Schaefer suspension binds up big time over that first hill. That's absolutely right. And and something, you know, I, I think it's air pressure in the tires was set a, a little, probably a little low for this event. And so those tires would just grab and, oh, yeah. and, and just stop. And I mean, the, the old adage of face hit steering wheel, foot hit gas. And he definitely did that and didn't have time to straighten it out and went up on two wheels over the pyramid, which is really frightening. Yeah, he kind of goes off to the left here on that pyramid, and then he's way off to the left on the side of the hill, which probably pushed the limit of the rules on that hill just a little bit, if they had any rules going into this event, as, as I say that. But uh, he's sideways on that hill, but he comes around that corner. It's probably one of the better corners of the evening because of where he was positioned at on that hill. 
And he doesn't look back at that point. Barefoot goes on to win this race. Uh, a couple things here from Jim Cramer that I found interesting on the broadcast. He says it's hard to control horsepower, especially in a track like this. You have to get on the gas, then get off of it. Try to maintain a smooth run. The engine is so responsive that if you hit the cars wrong, you're going to go straight up in the air instead of making any forward progression. I found that to be quite the quote from Jim Cramer and also the truth, honestly. And you kind of see it in this barefoot run where Fred's trying to constantly control this truck that's probably got, like I said, the most horsepower in the field at this time. And I think that comes from Fred and, uh, you know, his his drag racing background. And I know Jack Woolman's trucks were very similar. And those two obviously had that in common being, the, you know, the teammates that they were um, is those were very his his motors. Like you said, they were super responsive. And that comes from drag racing. You know, you need that horsepower right away. And that is really good, maybe on like a straight line track or something with some sweeping turns but on something with three obstacles in the first lane and one of those obstacles you're literally like climbing as opposed to you know as opposed to jumping it it bit him in this first round but you know fred is fred uh, you know hall of famer one of one of the better drivers this sport has ever seen i really feel like he learned something from this from this race that uh, will help him later in the evening yeah, one more thing here from Kramer, by the way. Before they actually get going, he does note that the pyramid is throwing trucks off to the left side, and that exactly that happens here. That happened with Excalibur. Uh, another little instance of the driver kind of maybe seeing a little bit more on the track than, say, the announcer that's just kind of there to watch is uh, Kramer doing an excellent job in commentary here, I thought. He, he Like I said, he knows exactly what he's talking about as we go into round number two. Uh, probably one of the better races, I would say, and two of my favorite trucks to watch as a kid. Virginia Giant, Bigfoot 4, Rich Hoosier getting to the line. And then you see, uh, looks like Deal kind of makes him wait just a little bit here. Bigfoot's already sitting on the line. And in the background, you can kind of see Giant just slowly coming out to line up here against Bigfoot. Correct. And and I think that speaks a bit to, to what we were talking about with Deal earlier is, you know, he's a pretty cool customer talking mm -hmm. with him in person. He's He, he doesn't get too animated. Um and he kind of knows how to play that game. And I mean, why be in a hurry? You know, yeah, exactly. you got a young kid who's, you know, a hotshot driver and looks like he's going to be the future of this team, but get in his head. And I, I, interesting, we made the, the comparison to Gary Porter earlier. Gary Porter always used to say the easiest driver he used to get be able to get in their head was Dan Runte as a young hot shot? He's going to be the future of this team driver, and he loved lining up and get, and he would always slow burn him at the line, light. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, Deal does the exact same thing. So interesting parallel there between you know similar drivers with similar futures and similar styles all the way around. Yep, very true here. Uh, we get a, sh a statement here from Jim Cramer that I find to be very interesting. Uh, something you don't hear pointed out very often is the fact that he says Deal is going to have to make essentially a blind corner, referring to the fact that both drivers here are sitting off to the left side in the vehicle. Uh, Deal is making a right turn, so he can't see what that right front tire is close to, what it's around, anything. Whereas Rich Hoosier has the advantage of seeing exactly where that left front tire is. He's hanging out the window just like uh, his predecessor, Jim Cramer, did all the time. Uh, it's it's interesting to me that he would say that, but it's very very smart analysis here from Jim Cramer when he does say that because you didn't you didn't necessarily think about that until he brought that to your mind and that's why I like what he says right there. Correct and 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 you know I I think that that plays into it a, a fair bit in that turn especially with as tight as it is. Um, I think another thing that's that's interesting here is the way that the two drivers approach the turn. And one thing that Rich kind of stood out in doing throughout this whole event is he wasn't afraid to use all of that track and then some to make that turn. Yeah. Where literally everyone else in the lineup was trying to stay within the dirt and make a tighter turn. You know, Rich was taking more time to go a little wider, but that little bit wider, as everybody knows with racing, when it comes to a turn, means faster on exit. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the first instances you're probably going to see that in monster truck racing is right here at this event. Uh, one thing I noticed here is they're getting ready to take off. Bigfoot is about a quarter of a tire's distance behind the actual starting line, whereas Virginia Giant is directly on that line. And it shows when they take off here. Uh, actually, Dill Wilson gets a little bit of a hole shot on Bigfoot. 
Yeah, and and Deal, in addition to the the extra space, which yes, that is absolutely correct. Deal's motor program obviously is very strong in that you know he's he's a pulling guy, so he's got big yep. horsepower there too. Oh, and yeah. um, you know, if there is one truck in that field that's going to stay with a Bigfoot four as far as power, you know, Deal Wilson is one of them. That and Barefoot, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, that that definitely uh, definitely made a difference. They were both pretty smooth over that first hill, um, but that. That pyramid that came up next really, again, showed that something in Bigfoot setup, Bigfoot Force setup, did not benefit it on that pyramid. No, it didn't. Mike Galloway does say here that Bigfoot is ahead, but when you look at the camera, you can clearly see that Bill Wilson's coming off of the pyramid and starting to head towards the car lane as Foot Force tires are still, the rear tires are still on the pyramid. So, Deal Wilson pulls out to, I want to say, about a truck length lead here going into the turn. And Correct. that's that is a uh, that is a hard deficit to overcome for anybody, including Bigfoot. Um, yeah. They don't and really show exactly what happens here at the finish line. But what we do see is Deal Wilson has a better corner. But Foot 4, as you were just stating, has a way better exit. And Bigfoot, with all that horsepower, comes flying down that straightaway, launches over those cars. They cut away from the side angle for some reason here. And then you see Bigfoot, almost a head-on POV-style angle coming over the finish line. And Bigfoot's declared the winner. But when they do flash to the side again, you see it's by about a truck and a half length. That's how much he gained on that straightaway and just launching it on the cars. Correct. And that that has as much to do with, you know, the momentum coming out of the turn, like you said, because when, when Bigfoot came off the pyramid, I mean, the camera cuts back to Bigfoot or to the wide, you know, the wide shot from the, the tight shot. And Bigfoot four almost comes to a standstill, binding up coming off of that of that pyramid. And they they both make really strong turns, but they make very different turns, like we said. Mm-hmm. And Eel makes the very tight turn coming around that corner. I think that's actually the words that Mike Galloway uses is, Deal makes a very tight turn. Bigfoot swings way out wide. And what that did is, like you, like we said on exit, it made Bigfoot so much faster and able to close that gap. And the suspension difference really came into play when they hit the cars because, you know, Deal, Deal still had very much what I would consider a stage one suspension underneath that truck. And Bigfoot 4 was one of the few purpose-built race trucks at the time. Mm-hmm. And so it had literally probably the best suspension in the world underneath that truck you know you can make some maybe some arguments for a couple of the golden state trucks and maybe bigfoot six but bigfoot four just soaks up that last hit over those six cars and comes off of it so smooth that there's almost no bounce especially for a you know truck in 1987 and and i think that that momentum and the suspension really played well for bigfoot on that last jump yeah it had to have i mean it almost looks like Dill wilson didn't hit the cars with the same amount of gusto as Bigfoot did. It looks like, uh, cause deal, like I said, he did have a little bit of a lead there coming out of that last turn. Uh, he hits those cars and then all of a sudden his lead just completely evaporates, goes away. It's like a drop of water in a spoon on a sunny day. It's gone. Yeah. As soon as, as soon as he hits those cars and uh Bigfoot just cruises onto the win here. An interesting thing though, Bigfoot cruises onto the win and that's it for round two, one race. Yeah, Bigfoot and it, suddenly gets a bye to the final round, and I don't understand this one whatsoever. Yeah, that one really irritates me looking back on it. Um, it irritates me that in a giant stadium that you're going to call the world finals that you're not at least going to have an eight-truck field, mm-hmm. um, especially when the weekend before you had, um, you know, you were running with AMPM Boss. You're running with, you know, a couple other trucks that could have filled out that field mm-hmm. and it made, it made it even. That being said, you got six trucks. There is no reason Excalibur doesn't come back to race barefoot in the second round. Yeah, as a fast loser or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or even Bigfoot Four and Excalibur, Virginia Giant and Barefoot. That would have that could have been a better way to put it with Bigfoot being at the top of the bracket, essentially. Um we go into the final round here though. Bigfoot number four and barefoot. Uh this race is probably one of your favorite races of all time, if not your favorite race of all time. Um you and I yeah. kind of <laughs> You and I kind of disagree a little bit on uh, the, whether this is the race of 87 or not. I still, I still to this day, I will say that it's Crimson Crusher and Mad Dog and that TNT event where it's Crimson Crusher rolls over. They're side by side all the way through that race. Why is this race so special to you? Um, you know, 
when your favorite truck wins the quote unquote world finals and you're six years old, they're, they're, that's going to make it your favorite race ever. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as me consider, and I really do honestly consider this the greatest monster truck race ever. Um, this single race, it, it is Bigfoot Barefoot, which is sorry to my fellow grave or to my gravedigger fan, you know, host of the show. Um, to me, this is the greatest rivalry that ever was in the sport. It was, you know, it was two, you know, two, it was Ford Chevy. It was two guys with, you know, two teams with just different outlooks with different, but, but, you know, with different philosophies, but they both wanted to win so bad Mm -hmm. and their top trucks at the time, you know, you can make an argument for six, you know, I, I understand that, but you know, Bigfoot four is Bigfoot four, probably the the greatest stage two truck, as you guys, you know, you and Jason Rona mentioned in the, in the 90 Louisville, you know, and I want to point out too, as a digger fan, that were those words hurt coming out of my mouth to say that too. I just want to point that out, (laughs) (laughs) but it's, um, it, it, and it's so close. It's so fast. I mean, that, that race would be fast now. Yeah. You know, that rate, the air that they both get off of that second stack would be a pretty good amount of air now. You know, it, it just everything about it, the, the venue, the, the crowd reaction. I mean, you can hear the crowd reaction over the truck engines. Mm-hmm. You know, everything about it just, just screamed, this is something special. And it, and it was. This, this I agree. Race this, is this race special. is extremely special. <laughs> This is a special race between, like I said, two trucks that literally were right down the road from each other. One in Granite City, one in Hazelwood. Bigfoot and Barefoot. Uh, Bigfoot pulls right around here, by the way. There is no rest for the wicked whatsoever right here. As Bigfoot literally wins the race against Virginia Giant, makes a U-turn, and goes right into that left lane to line up. Uh, interesting that Bigfoot... I don't know how they were doing lane choice here at all, but I'm pretty sure that Hoosier was just like, you know what, I'll take that. <laughs> it just goes right to that left lane. Whereas Fred goes to the right lane, which has been said to be what, uh, according to Jim Cramer anyway, the lane that nobody wants to be in. It's considered the bad lane. He thinks that the the hill is going to kick him off to the left, and it's not going to necessarily really be uh, helpful for Barefoot here. Each truck is lined up a little bit, a little ways behind the starting line here, but uh, much more fair than the previous races lineup because, uh, like I said, there was about a half a time higher length advantage to Virginia Giant right off the line on that last race. Like they just didn't care to line Bigfoot up closer, I guess. <laughs> uh, they leave the line here. And I believe if, if you're watching the same race, I am Bigfoot gets a slight bit of a hole shot on Fred Schaefer, but Fred kind of comes back a little bit as they are almost dead. Even when they hit that hill or excuse me, pyramid. Correct. And, and over that first hill, Fred has a lot better of a first hit um, where it's, it's super smooth coming off of it. And I think, you know, he what? learned his lesson from the previous round. Absolutely. Don't bonsai that first hill or you're going to taste uh, the rich leather of your steering wheel through your open face motorcycle helmet. Exactly. Um, but I think Fred benefited a bit from the way that Deal came over that, that pyramid the, the round before and really evened out that stack and kind of helped lean it back away from the, from the, from the camera side, the left side, to the other side and Fred hits that pyramid, you know, they kind of hit it together, but Fred, I mean, absolute, probably the best hit on that pyramid all night. Yeah, I agree. But not really far behind him, though, is Bigfoot's probably the second best hit on the pyramid all night. I mean, they were dead even coming off of there. Barefoot does pull out to about a half a truck length lead going into the turn here. Fred actually up on top of the hill when he makes this corner. He's not off to the side like he was the previous round. Same with Bigfoot. They're on top of the hill. When they come around this corner, though, Barefoot ha- has a much superior corner than Bigfoot. And he's got about a truck length, truck and a half length lead here. And then all of a sudden, it's down to a drag race. And, and honestly, when you put this in these trucks in this situation, I think probably maybe six out of ten times, the truck with the most horsepower is going to win this drag race coming out of this corner. However, here, Fred is not quite as straight as Rich Hoosier is. Uh, when Barefoot hits the cars, you can see that the tires are actually turned to the right when he hits the cars. When Bigfoot hits the cars, Hoosier's pulling down that straightaway as hard as he possibly can. He is dead straight, and he does not have to put any steering input into that vehicle, hardly at all, before he hits those cars. And I think that right there is where Barefoot loses this race, is that car stack. 
foreshadowing by Jim Cramer, as you had mentioned earlier in the event, uh, that's exactly where Barefoot loses. As yeah, soon as he gets those cars. And let's rewind a little bit to the turn. Um, you know, I, you, you say that uh, that Barefoot made the better turn, and I'll agree that Barefoot made the tighter turn. But just like the previous race, and even more so, Rich Hoosier swings way out wide on this turn. And I mm-hmm. think that's purposeful because coming out of that turn, Fred, Fred has a truck length lead. Coming to the cars, Bigfoot 4, which, like you said, is supposed to not have as much horsepower as Barefoot, makes up half of that distance before they hit the cars. Yeah. And so Bigfoot is swinging wider on that turn and carrying so much more momentum than Barefoot has coming out of that turn. I mean, just noticeably more momentum coming out of that turn. And you're right, Fred, I think the... The centering on the rear steer kind of, you know, I think he's kind of probably compensating a little bit for that. And by the time they hit the cars, Bigfoot has been straight and narrow for probably a good three truck lengths and is just bonsaiing that last the hit. I mean, that's one of the biggest hits you'll see in 1987. 1987, and, 1988, 1990, you yeah. name it. It's one of the bigger hits that you're going to see on a six pack of cars. Yeah. Bigfoot and Barefoot come to the line here and probably, I'm going to say, a photo finish. You really can't, and even in the angle that they show on TV, you really almost can't tell who wins the race until they kind of fast forward just a slight bit and you see Fred has one tire over the finish line, whereas Bigfoot's got both front tires over the finish line. Uh, one more thing to point out here in this race. Bigfoot is literally bouncing over the finish line, whereas Fred's got all four tires on the ground trying to chase him down. Fred has all four tires on the ground at the finish line, but when he comes down off the cars, whereas Bigfoot basically all but clears the cars, yeah. barely kisses the cars with the rear tires, whereas Fred... Yeah, one, thing, one thing I actually put in the notes here is Fred landed rear tires on the second-to-last car. Bigfoot landed on the last car. Correct. And it and it kicks Fred up. And if you really watch close, it kicks Fred slightly to the right. Mm -hmm. And in that next rebound, when the truck comes down, it bounces really strange. And that may, you know, we we touched on it earlier, whereas Fred, you know, maybe had something with his, you know, his air pressure and his tires might have been a little bit lower than possibly everybody else there. And it and it made for a bit of an erratic rebound all basically three times that Fred's rear kind of rebounds before he gathers it up. Whereas you're right, Bigfoot is, and this is what's amazing to me in this, is Bigfoot is bouncing the whole way because that jump is just so huge. But it's not stealing the speed away, the forward momentum, as Jim Cramer puts it. You know, he didn't lose his forward momentum, whereas Fred did mm-hmm. because, the, you know, he he got the weird bounce, the, the different bounce. I don't even know if I'd call it weird. But then his suspension and his tires, you know, set up kind of bounced it and, and it's and it's with its feet. You know, it's, it's a foot, but it's a it's a very important foot to the right or to the left on each bounce. And that that steals momentum from barefoot whereas bigfoot all the momentum was going forward every bounce was going forward and that was all and it was going to take all of that to like you said beat barefoot to the line by maybe inches. maybe 6 inches yeah well one thing we can both agree on there was a lot of foots in this race yes very much <laughs> and uh the the big one on the left side of the racetrack won it uh, big blue Ford pulls to the finish, but then all of a sudden, you see Rich Hoosier get out of the truck. He gets he shakes hands with somebody. I'm not sure exactly who that was, but he shakes that person's hand, and then all of a sudden, you hear another motor come out, and it's Virginia Beach Beast, and arguably at the time, probably the best tank truck in the country with uh, Mr. Townsend behind the wheel here. Beast pulls right up to the line, and a little bit of surprise here, because usually in these events, you would see the winner of the rubber tire monster truck race go out and take on Virginia Beach Beast or Bigfoot Fast Tracks or whoever it was. Barefoot comes back out. I was a little surprised by this, even watching it all those years ago. And still to this day, it makes me wonder, why didn't Bigfoot come out? Yeah, I've I've heard some people claim that Bigfoot wanted nothing to do with it. 
Now, I've never had I've heard that as well from different events where they would literally say, yeah, Bigfoot wants nothing to do with this tank tire or tank truck at all. Uh, I want to say it was a Pontiac event that I watched that I'd heard that on. Mm -hmm. But in this one, Barefoot comes out and there's really no explanation given. There's really nothing else said about Bigfoot the rest of the night. It's kind of a chance for Fred to kind of steal the show back a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and he does. Um, you know, Virginia Beach Beast and its little exhibition before it pulls to the line. Holy cow, does it have an adventure. Um, it goes oh, off, yeah. off the dirt onto the bare floor, which anybody that's met an arena or a stadium building manager knows that the building manager, wherever they were watching from, lost their dang mind when that happened. Because holy cow, that was like, there's a reason the dirt's down. Um Second, it hits that car stack on the on the the lane that Bigfoot just hit and noses into that last car. And I'm surprised that 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 Willie Towns didn't fly through the windshield when that thing hit because 21,000 pounds came to a dead stop in that last car. And that's got to yeah. be one of the most painful hits I've ever seen in all of monster trucks. Yeah, and you've you've shown me some stuff where tanks have landed extremely hard, and that that one's got to rank up there as probably one of the worst hits. Oh yeah, that a tank guy has taken. And to think of it, he does a little bit of a freestyle and then pulls right to the line to go racing. Yeah, <laughs> right yep. after that hit. Uh, like I said, Bigfoot goes out, wins this race. Uh, Barefoot pulls up against Virginia Beach Beast here, and. Barefoot does not waste any time against the tanks that were once called the uh, the way of the future a few times in a few broadcasts that I had seen back in the day. Um, Barefoot not going to uh, give an inch here. Lakes off the line, gets the whole shot, just flat murders Ridge and Peach Beast in this race. I'm sorry to say it. Beast cuts a tighter corner, but Barefoot is already gone at that point. He probably makes the best turn of the night in that left lane. Oh, yeah. As he comes around to uh, hit the cars and put it, put an end to this event. Correct, and yeah, Fred Fred made an absolutely amazing turn. Um, one thing that I've always kind of found interesting with this is they they cut to the shot of Virginia Beach Beast kind of trying to play catch up, and it makes mm -hmm. that amazing turn in the corner like all tanks can do. Um, and Mike Galloway starts yelling, "Watch out, Fred! Watch out, Fred!" And you don't see it. Um, you see the scoreboard, but it's so like, you know, blown out in the video. I, you know, I've even tried to mess with this footage to see if I could see what happens to Fred in the other lane, because when they cut back to him, that truck is so sideways coming off that yeah. last hit, but we never, you know, never see or never find out exactly what happened. But yeah, this wasn't close. And to be honest with you, um, it was, it was pretty lame just like most of the tank and truck yeah. battles were they were just lame races because they they were just they, they, they were never going to catch up to what the the big trucks were doing exactly they called these things the wave of the future i never thought so though i was a big virginia beach beast fan i love the way that that truck looked with that blazer oh, sure. looking body on there i love fast tracks as well and i really love the orange blossom special uh, the basically the train truck i loved it they they were unique but they could never quite ever match the popularity of those big rubber tired trucks and it's it still shows today every now and then though you see a tank come out and you're almost like oh wow i remember these things i almost kind of want to see a tank division come out say uh maybe at some jamboree events it'd be kind of cool to see a tank division uh, i don't think that you're ever going to see it though unfortunately um, let's talk about, uh, some of the older races where you would see a tank truck versus a monster truck, though. I remember there really only being one event that I can think of off the top of my head where the tank actually beat the rubber tired truck, and that was a Tampa event where they had, uh, I think it was Little Barefoot and Virginia Beach Beast, where yeah. Beast goes out and wins that race. That's the, like, the only one that I can remember. Can you remember any others? No, I mean, not off the top of my head, no. Um, and especially, it's, it's interesting because, you know, at this time, that that style of tank um, tank chassis was pretty much all that there was, you know, the, and there weren't a whole lot of them in, in 1987 with, you know, you had Virginia Beach Beast, you had Car Killer, you had that Gator tank starting to starting to make some appearances. Yeah, I love Gator, too. I love it, Gator. You know, yeah, Gator was sweet. That was I actually got to see it live at the St. Louis Arena in 1988. And you, you talk about just cool to see as a as a seven year old kid in the stands. But uh 
it was not until that kind of Bigfoot fast tracks and um, and track attack and and that style came around where even then I was kind of surprised to not see some of those win and they just didn't. And you're right. Mm -hmm. I think I think you're right. The Tampa event is about the only time I can remember one. And I'm sure they happen, you know, at non televised events or whatever. But as far as on TV, that, that's about all I can remember. Um, and it just it, it it's weight. It's, you know. I mean, 21,000 pounds versus 13 or 14 or 15,000 pounds. I mean, 6,000 pounds is a heck of a lot of, heck of a lot of machine to move. And oh, yeah. it's not going to do it. No, nope, unfortunately, they weren't able to do it. But like I said, Virginia Beach Beast is still, to this day, it holds a special place in my heart. Always did like that tank. Always, Like I said, I always liked the Bigfoot Fast Tracks as well, which, by the way, for 92K, you can currently own the Bigfoot Fast Tracks. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Houston 1987, that was one of, Probably one of the better USHRA events of that year. There's another one in Buffalo that I'd like to have you back on again sometime to cover with me as well. Uh, but until then, guys, this has been the Retro Monster Truck Review. I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, we'll go ahead. We'll use an old Richard Leak quote to uh, pull this one out. We'll see you again on the tracks across America. <laughs>